Okay, so welcome to this seminar on Sudan after the uprising. I'm happy to see so many of you here. Um, we are lucky to have three expert, experts flown in from Sudan uh, to enlighten us on recent events. With us, we have Professor Abdul Ghaffar from the University of Khartoum and Afad University for Women, Professor uh, Mansoul Asal from the University of Khartoum, and Associate Professor um, Mohammed Al Hajj Mustafa Ali from the University of Kassala. So, welcome to you. Uh, so, my name is Liv Tunnison, and I'm a research director at CMI. Um, and I'm not only lucky to lead this conversation, uh, I'm also lucky to work with these three gentlemen on a project funded by the Norwegian Embassy in Khartoum called Assisting Regional Universities in Sudan. So, um, on August 4 this year, the Military Council in Sudan um, and the Coalition for, Freedom and, uh, Coalition for Freedom and Change signed a constitutional declaration, paving the way for a transition to civilian rule in Sudan. So, Mansoul, is this constitutional uh, declaration a good starting point? for achieving freedom, peace, and, um, and justice, which were like the main slogan of the revolution in Sudan? Thank you very much, Leif, and I'm glad to be here. Uh, yes, indeed, it is a significant step, uh, given the fact that we are just coming out from 30 years of uh, dictatorship. It wasn't easy to get uh, to where we are now. Uh, the constitutional declaration took a lot of time of uh, painful negotiations between the FFC and the TMC of the Military Council. It does contain some loopholes and issues and problems, but still I think this is a very significant step. And with all the positive energy and attitudes that we are having, I think it paves the way for democracy. Uh, but for this to happen, we need to make sure that the transition is managed in a very good way so that we have a smooth, and successful transitional period. But my short question is that, yes, indeed, it is uh, an opportunity that will pave the way for uh, democracy in Sudan. You mentioned some loopholes. What are the loopholes that you see in the agreement? Well, the first one is uh, the one that is related to the appointment of the Chief Justice and the Attorney General. Mm -hmm. Because the document says that this is a responsibility of the Supreme uh, Council of Judges, which doesn't exist at the moment. And for that to, for that to exist, uh, there is a need for, uh, for uh, legal reform, which is a tedious process. But I think the document provided that in the absence of that Supreme Council of Judges, the, 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 the Supreme Council and the Cabinet together can assume the, 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 the role of uh, legislative body and can appoint the Attorney General and the Chief Justice. And I think today, there is a meeting between the Supreme Council and the Cabinet in which they would decide about the Attorney General and the Chief Justice. Yeah. What are the strong points? Of this? Uh, the strong point, I think, is the one related to the fact that none of the Cabinet members or the Supreme Council members is allowed to run for elections, you know, after the end of the transition period. And that is, I think, a, a caveat that was put there to avoid the Egyptian, you know, way of uh, Sisi, so that we don't have that, uh, we don't have another Sisi in Sudan. It was made very clear in the document that none of these people who were part of this transition period is allowed to run for elections. And I think that's a very good and strong point. Are you e equally an optimist, Abdul Afar? I am, in a way, yes. I am really optimist in a, in a way, but uh, still, I think there are uh, these loopholes which uh, Manuel talked about. And unless we really manage to overcome these kind of loopholes, we will not be able to really uh, succeed in the process of the uh, slogans we have really set. Uh, I think uh, the appointment to, of today of the uh, judiciary and the, the job involved in the process, this will be positive uh, contribution. And in, in that sense, I think uh, we might really proceed. But I think what we need to do is to go very slowly and to accept the fact that th nothing can happen in a, in a day uh, immediately. Uh, 
we have to we have to be very very careful in the process mm. itself. One of the sort of biggest demands of the the protesters were on justice, and by justice they they meant sort of holding the regime accountable for all that they have done during these three decades of uh, authoritarian rule, and especially on um, for what happened during the Ramadan massacre on 3rd of June, where the sit-in outside the headquarters in Khartoum were completely dismantled. Do you see this happening during the transitional period? If so, how? It, it is going to happen. It is going to happen, but uh, I think it has to be... Well, people have to be very careful about the the process itself, because it involves people who are really in power right now. Mm. And unless you really give them some sort of guarantees that they are not going to be judged on the kind of the mistakes they have taken, then they will be able to sabotage any kind of movement towards settling this problem. Would someone be sent to the ICC anytime soon? I am not quite sure, but I think uh, we would like, uh, as Sudanese, we would like to have uh, most of the Sudanese, I would say, would like to have the people being tried at home. Tried at home because really it covers quite a number of other issues. Mm -hmm. The ICC is really dealing with the Darfurian question and the kind of indictment in, in relation to that. But we have other issues which we would like really to settle in the kind of situation we have at home. Mm -hmm. So the popular uprising uh, that started in December 2018, it started not in Khartoum, it started in the regions of Sudan. Uh, and uh, Mohammed, uh, do you feel like the regions have been represented in the in the negotiations and the and the, um, uh, and the appointments that have <coughs> uh, recently come in Sudan lately? For these uh, interested uh, questions, I think this revolution uh, is uh, totally different from the that we have witnessed in Sudan during the previous uprisings. Uh, I mean, uh, for example, October Revolution in 1964 and, 19, and also April Revolution in 1985. So uh, the three uprisings are deal they dealt with. Uh, uh, tough dictator, uh, there are three uh, military, but the last one is a totalitarian one, and it is very uh, authoritative. Uh, the, the region actually are represented, uh, very represented in this last one. Even the start of revolution start at uh, Adbara, which located in the northern region of Sudan, and which may represent the stronghold of uh, Arab those who are uh, uh, trying to, 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 to be superior in the region as we, we read and as we hear from rebel in Darfur and this and uh, other uh, rebels movement or armed movement in Sudan. So the, the strongest start is start from regions. Then we hear about al Ubaid, Kassala, uh, Senar, Rabak, and uh, for example, uh, in, uh, in January, Lubayit uh, Hospital uh, doctor uh, uh, declared public uh, strikes, which represented one of the strong shock for the government and security forces. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, totally different uh, compared to the rest or, or the, the previous uprising. So the region are strongly represented. Mm -hmm. And now, even in the Sovereignty Council and the, uh, the, the council that will be formed in the future, the legislative one, the, all they are called for representation or equal representation, uh, similar to the, that we have seen in, in Khartoum. Mm -hmm. So before revolution, everything is, is done by the elite in Khartoum. But now uh, all regions are engaged and involved in this revolution. So this is a different. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Mansoul, uh, it was youth and, and, and uh, women protesters were are seen as the, the majority among the protesters. But to what extent have these interest groups been represented in the negotiations and reflected in the constitutional declaration and in the appointments thus far? Well, I think one of the, one of the key uh, features of this peaceful uh, change, 
was the significant contribution by 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 the youth and and women definitely um unfortunately this wasn't reflected in the uh, initial stages of the uh, negotiations actually i must say in all the stages of the negotiations there was a very insignificant presence of the youth and, and, and women. There are some youth, but women were, were, weren't really represented in, 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 in any meaningful way. Um, even in the cabinet, although we have few uh, young people and uh, two young ladies, and uh, the sovereign council uh, also, you know, we have uh, two ladies, but still, this is far below the expectations, given the fact that women really played a very important role. And actually, as I said, the basic feature of the change was that women and youth contributed very significantly. Uh, but perhaps the good news was that it is stated that in the Legislative Assembly, or the Transitional Assembly, as they call it, there would be a quota of at least 40% for women, which gives uh, some hope. Uh, but let me just say that we, we really shouldn't forget the fact that we are walking out of 30 years of a terrible dictatorship. And that is why, as Abdul just said, we should not expect that things happen as quickly as we wish. Of course, we, we would like to, to see change, but it takes time. And I think uh, if we could manage the transition in a successful way, I think we are uh, going to put the country in the, in, the, in the right track. And we will eventually see a better and good representation for women and, and youth. But why do you think they were excluded in the negotiations? What are the underlying sort of uh, causes for that? Well, I think we, we need to look at the structure of the FFC, which is a, a coalition of too many groups and political parties. And we have also to realize the fact that we have problems with, within our political parties. Although these parties call for democracy and all of that, but they don't have democracy within their structures. And if you look historically, all the different political parties, women are not really represented in any meaningful way. Probably the NCP, as bad as it was, had some kind of uh, women presence more than you know, the rest of the other political parties. So this is a structural problem that goes back into history and is part of the problems that the Sudanese political parties are suffering from. So Aldo Rafar, who are the spoilers? How well, do we the, not end up as uh, Egypt and Sisi? Well, that, the spoilers <laughs> are too many. <laughs> there are spoilers who are regionally. Uh, there are spoilers who are in the center. Mm. And in the, the political parties especially are the major spoilers in this kind of situation because they who have already heard Sadiq al-Mahdi calling for an early election. Mm. This is actually a repeat of 1985 uh, kind of situation. And he wants to come. And also the political, the, the Communist Party is standing aside. There are, these are the kind of opposition you have at home. In addition, of course, to the uh, old regime uh, members mm. who are really for then there is the fighting groups who could be really uh, an opposition in, in themselves uh, unless you really manage to settle that kind of uh, situation peacefully and respond to the kind of demands they have, they can be uh, spoilers yeah. as well. But with the f fighting groups, who, do, who are you referring to? I am referring to the, uh, to the Blue Nile, to the uh, southern uh, uh, Kurdistan and Southern Darfur, and also to the uh, to the, uh, the armed, uh, armed groups. Uh, 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 yeah. uh, the armed groups in general. Mm. These are the, they can be spoilers. And then there is the regional powers. Mm. The regional powers are really involved in the situation, and that is uh, mainly the Egyptians, the Saudis, the Qataris, and all these kind of situations which you have really boiling, in addition, of course, to the problems of the Horn of Africa in itself. There are quite a number of problems within the region as such. The international community, 
outside this kind of situation can play a very important role. Yet, it is so far, we can't really see any kind of reaction coming out f from that kind of community. So you have th at least four spoilers who are involved in this kind of situation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Mohammed, um, I've... Uh, I've experienced for a long time that the youth in Sudan, they are very sort of um, uh, disappointed with the political parties, not only the Islamist NCP, but all the political parties. They feel excluded, they're patriarchal, they don't feel at home in them, and they've started created different youth movements. But if we fast forward three years and there are elections in Sudan, will it still be the same old political parties that would stand for election, or do you see that... Um, do, do you foresee that new political parties would form and, and we will see a real change? Because if the old political parties are still there, it's still the old Khartoum elite that will become to dominate and come to power again. Okay, so I see now the opportunity is for the youth to form new uh, party in order to be represented. Because, you know, the old parties is still fail to deliver the dream of those youth who flood in the street in order to change the reality. Uh, even the, the parties like Umma and uh, Ittihadi, uh, the Islamist party, ANCB, all of them fail uh, to, 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 to integrate youth inside their uh, structures. For, for example, if we, we, we took Umma, is still dominated by Sadiq al Mahdi and his family. So there's no opportunity for the for the youth to be uh, to join this party. And I have heard that from my colleagues, the youth that uh, are were in the city before near the military headquarters, they are going or they they are intent to form new party in order to represent. And sometimes they they said it should carry the name of the youth themselves is, for example, Sudanese Youth Party or something like this, mm -hmm. in order to, 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 to deliver their voices to, 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 to the world and to the, uh, to the country itself, yeah. Mm. Okay. So the constitutional declaration does not say anything about the role of Islamic law. Why, and is it a problem, Mansoor? Uh, this is a tricky question. Uh, I think that was put aside deliberately. Uh, for some people, they say that we actually have more important issues to, to deal with during the transitional period than getting ourselves locked into uh, this kind of debate that's not going to take us anywhere. And on the contrary, it will give the opportunity to the uh, political Islamists and the Salafists to, you know, try to meddle in the transitional period. Mm. Uh, it is an issue that, that's going to, to, to be with us. I don't know for how long. But my personal reading is that uh, for political Islamists, the situation is really becoming very difficult for them. I think it's going to take them decades to try to, to do something or to get back. Because now there is a very strong sentiment the public sentiment that's against uh, using religion, you know, in the, in public life, and people are becoming very vocal, very daring, to to say that no, we 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 are done with this kind of discourse, you know, we have been cheated for thirty years, so please, and uh, I think that is also uh, a careful, uh, you know, uh, step by the FFC, and perhaps also the military, not to antagonize, you know the old kind of guards, you know, that still uh, try to use the religious card for their own purposes, of course. But then if you look at the situation, or as far as the Salafis are concerned, they are cornered, they don't have supporters, and I kept saying that they failed to organize a single demonstration that would, you know, show that they have something or that they have support. So I am not concerned that the question of religion was left out. Actually, I, I, I thought it was a wise uh, and calculated decision not to really get into it in the document or during the transitional period. Of course, as I said, we'll have to deal with it. But for now, I think let us have a smooth transition that would address peace, the economy, and uh, lifting the country's name from the list of the countries exposing terrorism. But uh, in addition to this, I would like to add 
uh, one thing, that uh, you have the slogan of freedom, peace, and Just. justice. This is actually freedom as when it's put at, at the beginning. It really recognizes implicitly, it recognizes that the country is diversified. And therefore, whoever rules the country has to recognize that there is a difference. There is a, a sort of a, a diversity within, within the country itself. And I think implicitly this, uh, as Manzou said, the people really put the, the, the kind of uh, beliefs that people have aside. They, they, they have the freedom to, to choose, they have the freedom to be Muslims, to be Christians, to be non-religious uh, organization. This kind of freedom is really there. And that is really allows them quite a number, uh, quite uh, a choice. Uh, and it is a very good recognition of the kind of the diversity that we have in the country as a whole. The big question is how women's civil rights within personal status law is going to be ruled. That is a very thorny issue when it comes to uh, should Islamic law continue to determine, determine Muslim women's rights within this area or should Sudan go for a completely civil law? So. Well, I think I think even even during the regime of Bashir, there were a lot of uh, attempts. I think you are aware of this. You probably you, you even uh, were part of of this. There were a lot of attempts to reform the personal status law. Mm -hmm. I, I I'm not following exactly what happened with that, but I think there is a room for uh, for 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 this kind of of change to, to take place. And I, I just kept uh, giving the examples of uh, surrounding Muslim countries. You have Turkey, you have Jordan, you have Egypt. These are predominantly Muslim, uh, you know, countries, but they don't have serious issues. Of course, there are issues with even in those countries, but not as as pronounced as ours. So, let us uh, look at the region, the other experiences, and also let us try to move step by step. I think eventually we will get there. So, Mohammed, you mentioned that you know Sudan is uh, has a rich history of. Um rising against military dictatorships. And you have um, had popular uprisings in 1964 and 1985. But every time um, we had very short sort of um, civilian uh, periods of civilian rule and we went back to military or Islamist dictatorships. So Abdul Ghaffar, what is different this time around? I think the difference is really the, the fact that uh, people have realize that they cannot really uh, just uh, change the thing by force. It has to be in a way a peaceful situation. It has to be, uh, uh, when you look at the situation in, 19, uh, uh, in 1964 and in 1985, you have to realize that the uh, Political parties have come in. They have really tried to change the situation the way they can benefit out of it. But now it is the youth, the women, the younger generation, which is really showed, shows, uh, it realized that they have made quite a number of mistakes, these people who ruled the country before. It is not a question of who uh, uh, who rules the country, but how it is ruled. And uh, I think this is, this, the, the question now is how to rule the country. How is it, it, it is going to be ruled and who is going to rule it will come next. I think uh, it, is, it is really a sort of a step uh, that, that we haven't reached as yet. We have to decide which, how, we are going to rule the country. I think this is the, the difference between the 1950, uh, 1985 and the present situation. The new generation, which is really coming to power now, is a, a generation which is, doesn't believe in what uh, the other groups have really done so far. It is really trying to do, it is best to try to uh, set a new way of uh, running the country. Mm. Yeah. And also this period, it, it sets out a quite, quite unusually 
long transitional exactly. period. So we will have election only in three years. Yeah. Is this based on sort of lessons learned from the previous um, experiences? Yeah, I think I think this is critical. And uh, let me just say that in the previous uh, uprisings, 1964 and 1985, we had similar problems. There was war in the country and there was lack of democracy. Now in, 18, in 1964 and also in 1985, the weak link in all this was actually the sectarian parties. The UMA, the DUP, and to some extent the Islamists, who were rushing to get to power positions. So they rushed the transition, which was just very short, one year. They went to, they want to get democracy. Unfortunately, they, 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 they failed, they, they lost both. They didn't achieve peace, and they didn't get democracy. Because in, in 1985, the transition period was just one year. They went to election. They totally disregarded the SPLM, which was fighting the government at the time. And, you know, four years later, there was a military coup. Hmm. That is why I see that the insistence of the FFC to have a longer transition period is, is very justified. So that they achieve peace. And personally, I would actually say that achieving peace in the context of Sudan is much more important than democracy. Because you cannot have a a sustained democracy if you have war. Mm. So the, the length of the transition period will make it easy or, or make it possible to achieve peace and then we go to elections. Um, and I think the FFC got the lessons from the previous past uh, failed, you know, to, we have successful uprisings but failed transitions. Mm. So having a, a, a long transition period I think is healthy for achieving both peace and democracy in the long run. But this is also like the, the Islamist regime were the longest standing sort of dictatorship in Sudan. So many of those that we are talking about, the young generation, they have been born and raised during this regime. And, and this regime has, and you have come up with the term, they've created almost like a parallel state. Sure. It's really like a deep state. How do you dismantle it? Um, it's not easy, but luckily, as I, I said in one of the blogs that I wrote, I, I, I think what we have is not a deep state. We have parallel state, mm. you know, mm. which means that with, uh, with legal reform and, uh, and a tough, uh, you know, stand by the traditional cabinet, I think we can, we, can, we can dismantle these structures. And the very fact that the NCP has just disappeared, you know, at, or at least that's how I, I see it, means that these people can easily be dealt with. Mm. So there is a chance, and what makes this chance even stronger and, and more possible is the fact that these people lost sympathy. Now we are looking at them as just a bunch of thugs and thieves. Mm. And the president is in, the, in, the, in jail <laughs> complaining about mosquitoes, you know? So this is, a, it's not easy, but there is a chance that you, we, we can deal with this. Another sort of difference that I've noticed yeah. um, is the strong role of the diaspora in both in the uprising and also in the aftermath. Could you say a little bit about the role of the diaspora? The, the diaspora is, uh, it has the taken diaspora. a very important role in, in the country, trying to uh, enlighten people, the to trying to enlighten the international security. But I must say that there is also one thing which I have to uh, talk uh, to, to uh, address uh, with the diaspora. And that is merely these people are a little bit removed from the country. Uh, the demands we are now seeing are, uh, and people are very hurriedly trying to see the changes that happens. The, if, if, the, if you put them back into the country and they realize the situation of how difficult it is really to 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 uh, to manage the situation in the in the country itself it is very difficult indeed i think it can play a positive role it can enlighten the international community it can enlighten the members of the diaspora itself but at the same time it can really it has to be a little bit patient it has to realize that things are really going to take place gradually. And that is the kind of situation which they are really now caught into. 
Thank you. So, when the Sudanese took to the streets in December 2018, um, at the forefront of the demands, or what initially prompted it was um, lifting of subsidies and hardship, uh, economic hardships of, of people. So uh, many sort of framed it as a bread riot and uh, uh, became um, uh, framed as uh, a protest against the economic and political misrule of this regime. Um, <clears throat> It is quite apparent that we need uh, substantive economic reform in the country. Um, what do you see as the necessary steps for this to take place and actually change uh, norm ordinary people's lives, uh, Mohammed? Okay, thank you, Leif. I, I think at the current uh, stage of uh, development, just we can deal with, uh, uh, with the short run issues. Now people are queuing, uh, still queuing for period still the car queuing for fuel in Khartoum. It is not totally different from what we have seen during al-Bashir regime. Mm -hmm. So now we are relying on our partners, for example, AEU, African Union, and Gulf countries, maybe Saudi Arabia, AEU, to support us in order to, 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 to pass this stage. For the long run, I think we, we, are, relay, we are going to, to do some uh, restructure for our economy mm -hmm. in order to, 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 to give uh, more opportunities to the private sector in order to run the economy. Because if we go back uh, to, to, to the previous period during the Bashir regime, uh, we don't have a pure uh, capitalistic system. Mm -hmm. It is totalitarian system that but the, the, the supporter of al-Bashir, they are uh, capturing everything in the economy and they exclude the rest of the uh, private sectors. Most of the people maybe take their money and go outside to Egypt, to Ethiopia, to Kenya, to Uganda, to invest there. Why? Because if they stay here, they will, be, uh, they will suffer from taxes, which will um, al-Bashir follower, no taxes will be imposed on them. So they, they will bear the burden of the development to run the infrastructure. It will be the taxes will be excised on them instead of the whole economy. So the, the first step is to uh, build a very transparent economy in which a private sector, uh, the actors treat it equally. The tax will be distributed equally, the burden of tax, and then we can use these resources to, to, to strengthen our uh, infrastructure in order uh, to develop. Uh, the most important thing also is the corruption. So um, I cited here Mansour Khalid. He mentioned that during the period from 19, 19, 1919, that means when we are under British rule, till 1993, there are maybe uh, 25 uh, retirees, those who retire from the civil service. But during the period 1989 till 1993, 75,000 of those who belong to civil service and who, who were very well-trained uh, civil service servant, they are dismissed by al-Bashir and his uh, uh, government. So we need to rebuild, rebuild the civil service. Why? Because if you want to attract, for example, foreign investor to come to Sudan, you need to, 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 to make uh, uh, you know, good business practices and to, to be a very conducive environment in order to, to attract foreigners to come to invest. Because, you know, um, now you cannot borrow from uh, in international institution at the current stage. Uh, even if the opportunity open to us to borrow, this will not be, uh, will not continue forever. So in, in order to build our economy, we need uh, to attract foreigners in order to invest. And this will be uh, done by preparing uh, the, the country. So the corruption is very bad. And also we have the issue of subsidies. For example, now the government subsidizes fuel. And even the U.S. jalon of uh, benzene is cheaper than the liter of benzene here in Norway, which is supplying uh, oil to, to the world. So how the government can subsidize 
this uh, fuel and keep education and other civil services without funding. We need to remove these uh, subsidies in order to sell uh, the fuel at the the, 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 the price is that equivalent to, to the international market price. Mm -hmm. And this will be the right step in the right direction. So, yeah. yeah, obviously we need um, um, to spend the money in a different way and more on, on, on sort of public goods. But where should income come from? So Sudan have gone from uh, a place where they were heavily relying on oil until the separation with South Sudan. But you say that you want to attract foreign investors, but what should they invest in? Okay, so I think we have other resources. We have other natural resources. We can export gum, Arabic gum. Now it is mm -hmm. uh, it it earn a lot of money for the country, and also we have gold. Mm -hmm. The gold is smuggled to Egypt, to Eritrea, to Ethiopia, and we have cesium seeds. So we have many products. We have animal resources. We can export it to the rest of the world and then bring this hard currency. But if we talk about the current situation. What we rely on is to, to remove sanction, to leave Sudan from a uh, terrorist sponsor state list that uh, prepared or designed by the USA, mm. which he may take a uh, little bit time to be done. But if we integrate uh, our economy, at least with the rest of the world, and the money flow in and out, this may help in partially sol give some solution for this problem. Mm. Okay. Like you say, uh, getting Sudan off the list of um, countries that support terrorism is really essential because it would attract um, loan. You can get loans for the World Bank, for example. But how would Sudan go about doing this, Mansoor? Uh, the plan? Well, it is tough. It's not easy. It's going to take time. Uh, but there is a chance. Uh, you might have probably followed the participation of our Prime Minister in the 74th uh, UN General Assembly in New York and the kind of warm reception he received. And a couple of days back he was in Paris meeting the French president. So, and he actually stated that he, he received a, a very strong uh, commitment from the US government that they will lift the name of the country. It might take some time, mm. but I think there is a chance for, uh, for us to, to get off that uh, list because this is very critical. We all have seen that Economic sanctions were lifted in 2017, mm. but we, we got a whole lot worse. Actually, we were, we were better off you know, while the sanctions were there. So I think lifting the country's name is very critical to everything that we're talking about. Mm. It would be uh, very critical even to the transitional period as a whole, not only for the economy. So uh, uh, it's, it's going to take time because this is not something that Trump can easily say it's a congressional kind of, of situation. Mm. But there is a chance that this is going to happen here. Yeah, I, I think also from a political point of view, now those who went to the setting and uh, took the uprising, they are just waiting to change the reality. And the, 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 their argument is that before they, uh, they said that um, why we go outside, we want to integrate to the rest of the world, we, we, we want to, to be dealt with as a normal citizen in the rest of the world. Even some of them, they said, this is our passport. Before we can go from one, one airport to another, we are Sudanese, we are very respected. But after the Islamists come to the rule, we are changed and people uh, think that we are terrorists. Although we are most peaceful, nation in the world. You can even, anyone now, foreigner can walk in the street of Khartoum without protection, without protection from police or security forces. So I think the gift that the international community that can give to us is to delete Sudan from terrorist uh, support, uh, supporting state. Mm. So, so we can say to our enemy, enemies in the NCB, look, now we are free and you are, uh, uh, you are deteriorating our life for uh, this long period of time. You know, we have shortage in drugs, some life-saving uh, drugs. In, if you go to pharmacies, not exist because either we can import it from Jordan, from Egypt, and most of people claiming this is fake drugs. It sometimes is smuggled through the borders. Why? Because we cannot deal with developed, nation and bring treatment, drugs to our patients. So, so that is what we look for. We are waiting for delisting Sudan. And I think when we delist it, from, to be delisted from the list, there will be a huge celebration in the country. Mm. Yeah, thank you.
But as you say, people are still queuing for fuel. Uh, the bread prices are still um, very high, uh, although some money are starting to come back to the bank. So you, when you go to the ATM, there will be some money there. But when, when could people expect that there is real change in their lives? I think for the, 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 for example, if we took the bread, for example, the queue for bread, mm. it is a matter of we need to import more uh, wheat, although we have very fertile land. But the, the, the question here, why we do not go to our land and grow this product locally in order to import it from outside? It is a matter of policy, policy, economic policy that need to be changed. Mm. Yeah, in order to take the resources and put it in the agriculture in order to develop the sector and then provide people with food. What Al-Bashir said, just they put the money in their the importers, they bring cars from outside, they bring furniture, they bring food, goods, commodities that we are not familiar with and put it in the economy. Mm. One of them is, the, is cars. If you go to the street of Khartoum, I'm here in Pergin, but you can see the beautiful car that moving in the street of Khartoum is uh, crowded with, that is maybe cars made in 2019 even, and driven by foolish people. Why? <laughs> These are our resources. So we need to, to stop importing car mm. and just to focus on our land, on our uh, uh, internal means of production to develop. So this is a, a real question. So uh, during Bashir's um, regime, uh, like estimates of 60 to 70 percent of the national budget would you, were allocated to the military and the security, while two percent to education and two to health. Um, so, I mean, it's obvious that there needs to be some downsizing, right? But according to the constitutional declaration, the military is in charge of its own reform. <laughs> is this potentially a huge problem? Obvious. Yeah. <laughs> it is a huge problem. And I think... Uh, the military doesn't really want to reduce the kind of budget it has. Mm. But at the same time, I think once you settle the kind of issues which are raised, uh, and that is where this issue of peace becomes very important, then you automatically you are reducing that kind of situation. Mm. The question now uh, which people ask is the involvement we have with this... Uh, with this uh, fight in, in Yemen. Can we withdraw the kind of uh, armies we have in that kind of situation? And this would reduce the kind of budget we have. There are quite a number of issues, but at the same time, you have to be very careful in this kind of situation because I think the people who are really in power now, uh, the military council, who are really in power in the kind of situation, they are afraid of the, the, the kind of change that, kind, that might really take place. And in any kind of situation where you reduce the budget a little bit, I think they can really start mobilizing people uh, in, in, in the rank and file, and it starts really to, to, to move against you. It is true now, I think it is the high price which is really important in the army and it is trying to keep the situation as it is. But there is a lot of pressure from the rank and file on this kind of group. And that is really going to take some time. It is going to take a, a little bit of, uh, of time to, to adjust the kind of situation. I don't think we need to rush into this kind of situation, into reducing the budget of the army as such. But at least we should really start thinking of settling the war, draw, withdrawing from the, the, the regional wars we are really taking part in, it, and that is eventually will get the, the army to size. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not very concerned, actually. Uh, about the fact that the military itself is entrusted with restructuring itself. Uh, they already started the process by restructuring the National Intelligence and Security Services. Now it's called General Security. And I think they dismantled the so-called operations forces, which were part of NIS, like 13,000 heavily armed 
you know, security forces. And they were telling them, you either retire or you get into the armed forces, but you cannot continue. And I think that is a very significant step because this is the force that was, you know, uh, committing all these heinous crimes, you know, killing people with impunity and arresting. Now, now the Nice people cannot arrest you arbitrarily. They cannot detain you. They cannot search you, you know. So that is a significant step. And I think the military came to the conclusion that it has to restructure itself. It came to the conclusion that it cannot, from now onwards, rule the country by force. And I think this is in itself is a very significant change. The military, of course, as Abdul said, especially the top brass, they are the ones who are benefiting from Bashir's legacy. The rank and file are getting very little salaries, actually. So they resist, for sure, but then they also know very well that this situation is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. Something has got to happen. And they already started in, in, in that process. Uh, the military, as far as I, I know, they need some kind of assurances, you know, that they are not targeted, you know, because they, of course, they have their legitimate fears, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so there is a possibility that uh, the army will be restructured. It's going to take some time, but I think eventually it will happen. Yeah, I can ask questions forever, probably, but I want to open up uh, so the audience can ask some questions as well. I'm sure there are many. No, no one? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, you talk about the, the revolution before and it's and then you are talking about how this present one will be different. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I'm just wondering uh, if there are any uh, steps taken to sort of uh, draft a constitution that will make a uh, military coup uh, in the future uh, outrightly illegal so that you don't have the similar, you know, uh, what you've had in 64 and 85. Thank you. Should we gather some questions before you answer? Yeah. Uh, Gunnar is on my list, and then Sarah and Huayda. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, excellent update. I think uh, one word which uh, you used, uh, I think all of you, is very important, that one of the big challenges to this revolution may be the lack of patience. Uh, because uh, on the one hand, the revolution is protected by the people, uh, and it has been extremely impressive what has been achieved but is also protected by uh, somebody who may be uh, the devil himself, at least conceived of such, Hemeti. Yeah. And it is a fact that he, in a way, he, like it or not, protects the revolution. Sure. And uh, you all probably want to get rid of him. So <laughs> this, man how you manage this trans transitional period, this is the only one of the issues, in addition you have mentioned the others. And the other day, as you saw, uh, Abdel Wahad El Noor said he totally rejected what has been achieved <laughs> sitting in Paris for years. It has to be neutralized somehow, and so there are so many. So my, these are my comments, but my question is, um, uh, do you think that you have now got the right uh, prime minister for, uh, for dealing with this? Sarah? Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Uh, my question is um, really for anyone, but probably Munzul is best um, equipped to answer. Uh, I'm just wondering what the implications have been and will continue to be for migration. Uh, Sudan has a very generous uh, migration uh, policy in welcoming people, both as uh, temporary migrants and as um, refugees. And so I'm just wondering if there's been any changes to the kinds of policies or the anticipations of uh, changes to those policies. Will it become more closed and to specific groups and why. Should we take a short round and then have uh, way done and end on my list after that? Yeah. Okay, um, but to the question about the constitution, I think the transitional period is, is, is governed by the constitutional declaration. And I am, my two colleagues here might correct me, but as far as I know, the issue of the constitution is going to be left to the elected government. 
But for now, we have the constitutional declaration that's going to govern uh, the transitional period. There might be preparations for the constitutional work, and of course, also the legal reform. But for now, we have the document that was signed on the 17th. Uh, Gunnar's Himetia, he's, he's a very, it's, uh, it's, very it's not easy, <laughs> because he has a terrible past, no question about that, but he also played a very significant role in this revolution, whether we like it or not. He protected people, and uh, surprisingly, he is a sort of a doer guy, you know, when he says something, he does it. And just a week ago, he took Riyak Mashar from Khartoum and uh, to Juba, so that he, he meets with Salfa. And even the armed group, they would say that they trust him at tea as a negotiator than anyone else, because they believe that he's someone who can, who can, uh, who can uh, deliver. Mm. So it's an ambivalent uh, guy, but I think whether we like it or not, he, he's going to be there for a long time. And uh, now the thinking in Khartoum or in Sudan generally is that probably some form of uh, transitional justice, uh, peace and reconciliation, truth and reconciliation would, you know, put all these things on the table and that people may get uh, a formula whereby people like Himeti can somehow be accommodated. Because I don't foresee Himeti in jail. I really don't see that coming. Not very soon. So we have to deal with that. Uh, Sarah's question, I think the policy is still there, there's no change, but the new cabinet has said clearly that it's going to review a lot of policies, including giving Sudanese citizenship to foreigners. They will review the citizenship of, of all those naturalized foreigners, you know, during Bashir's regime, because there were rumors that there were a lot of malpractices, especially with the Syrians. So that is going to happen, but I think the migration policy is not going to be changed, at least in the short run. With reference to this kind of uh, situation where we have to need some patience in order to get the uh, reforms we need, there is this, this uh, uh, regime of Bashir has ruled for 33 years, and you cannot really just change that within six months or at least three years. You have to be uh, patient enough to, to uh, go through this process very slowly and try to, to change it. How can you really convince people to accept that? That is really a question which is really in, in very important to deal with right now. The second thing is uh, this uh, issue of emity. And uh, I think uh, if you look at uh, Khurtum today, you will find that SAF has really, the, the uh, military forces have really taken aside. It is Hamiti who is really, uh, whose forces are really controlling the whole situation. And I think he is really, in a way, the most strong person so far uh, within, within the uh, the fighting group within the, the military situation. And I think uh, he will take some time. It will take some time to really force him out of this, the kind of situation he has. And I think probably one has to revise the whole kind of issue in relation to Hibiti. If he is really well trusted, as uh, Manzul said, by the people even who were fighting against him. If, if uh, people in Darfur, uh, Abdel Wahid and others, are really now uh, sort of uh, feeling that, at least uh, many, uh, the, the Zagawa group, they are feeling that they are uh, really able to negotiate with Hamiti and uh, reach some sort of conclusion with him. If you, if you really, get into that kind of situation, then you have to realize that this is going to be a, a person who is really going to be for a long time in this kind of situation, and you have to find some way, some balances 
to really get him out of the problem he has right now, whether this is the ICC or whether the uh, fighting group themselves. You have to have a historical compromise where you can really fit him in the right position he should be really in. Okay, so for regarding the question by Prof. Gunnar, I think it will be better to 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 to, to see him on the boat instead of, for example, if we threw him away and now he in Darfur, maybe he's going to do something else. Yeah, and even I I know that people rejecting Hemeti um, armies because they think they are more undisciplined. Yeah, but according to, 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 to the information that available to me, and even I negotiated with some army officer, they said that in each truck, for example, you find that there are three from Himeti forces, that uh, rabbit forces, and there is one from uh, intelligence, and there are three also from armed forces. So they are mixed Why? in order to make them uh, to deal uh, in disciplined way with civilian people. So w when you see a, a truck in Khartoum situating in any place in the street, they, they, are, they are not uh, not all of the, on that truck are belong to the, 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 the rabbit forces. So at, at the current stage, we need Hemet, I think, at least to 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 keep uh, those who belong to the N NCB saying no words at least. Thank you. Why is that? And can you see that, um, for example, now they're not also well represented in the uh, both cabinets. Do you see that it uh, it will be good for the future? I mean, after the transition state, that there will be more female, since they are not allowed or by the agreement that if you are appointed now, you cannot uh, be appointed in the, after the transition state. And uh, this is shall I say all the questions? Yeah. The same? Yeah. And for um, Abdul Ghaffar, um, how do you see it, if it's not a fake news, the coalition between Salah Ghosh and Al Tihad al Demokrati? Is that true? I mean, it's on the social media, since you mentioned the Ummah and then the Al Tihad al Demokrati as well, that um, now on scene. And uh, to you, Mohammed, uh, you mentioned that we need an international aid. Is that true? Uh, because is that the problem? I mean, for example, the queuing for the bread. Is that a problem of mismanagement? and the distribution or the shortage of the ingredient by itself. I was in Sudan this summer, and uh, people, they start making bread at home. So the ingredients are there. And uh, there are two bakeries in the area where my family lives. One is owned by Syrian and another one by a normal Sudanese. There was no bread in the Sudanese bakery, but there was bread on the Syrian one. The Syrian one, it was expensive, but I mean, there is no queue. Or at least people like they can find bread from there. I talked to the owner of this Syrian um, bakery, and uh, he mentioned that yes, the price is very high, but they don't get like the flour subsidized, so they have to buy it uh, like really with the price that they, uh, all the uh, public can can get it for. But when I talked to the person uh, to the bakery uh, that's owned by the Sudanese one, they said that okay, we don't have the the flour, but. People, they go there. Whenever I go to any grocery, I can find people like buying a lot of bread. My family as well, they start making bread at home. So is it a problem of distribution or shortage of the goods? And uh, I understood that an economist, right? And um, also the investment by the foreigners. Uh, do we really need it now? Uh, because we, we have qualified people, but they didn't get the chance to work. Um, I traveled from Khartoum to Lubaid uh, using the Barra Road. And it's after the, or during the, re, uh, the rainy season. And I can see like there is a lot of land that can be invested. We have the cattle, and also we have the agricultural area. So do we still need the foreigners to come or we can do it by ourselves? Thank you. Um, it was great listening to you, and thanks a lot for you know uh, excellent moderation as well. You know, because you 
pointed to many of the important questions. I also think, you know, that it's great to see so many people attending a Sudan seminar. It's like in the good old days. And just to comparison, we had a couple of weeks ago in Oslo a Sudan seminar, and it was 80 people attending, 80. It's zero. You know, so there's a, a lot of interest in this. And I think this, you know, me representing the government, it's very, very welcome. Of course, there are many issues that we could uh, touch upon here. Um, and notice a bit of um, maybe hesitance to celebrate in the panel. Uh, maybe because you're tired. Maybe it's because, you know, you're, the reality is just sinking in. I don't know. But it was one comment that, that you made, Abul Wafa, that I thought was very, very interesting. And maybe you and the others can also elaborate on. Because you said the issue now is not who governs, but how the Sudan is governed, how it's ruled. Uh, could you elaborate and maybe have some ideas for lessons learned, how to take this forward? And, and if you have good ideas, those ideas should then go to the peace negotiations as a way to unlock you know, the entrenched problems, which is really the centre-periphery issue in the Sudan. Uh, Hoida, your question about the future chances for women to, to be part of the... I think uh, the decision in the, in the, or the clause in the Consul Declaration that barred those who take part in the current transition period to run for elections was meant to guard against the military, you know? So that they will not uh, uh, come back again and, and you know become like the Egyptian case. Uh, so this is independent of, uh, of of women. But as I said in the assembly, there were already talks that forty percent at least would be for women. I think there is a lot of, uh, of chances for women to to be more represented. And also, I think we might actually witness the formation of new political parties that would accommodate the youth and other groups. And that is also another chance for women to, 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 you know, to be more uh, represented. Uh, and there is the issue about who, you know, the question is not who govern, but how to govern. I think this is critical. Now, the transitional period is a parliamentary system. You know, and people went to this option because of the terrible experience with Bashir who was, uh, because during Bashir, the system was presidential. And the president has all the powers, he can dismiss everything, he can do what he wants. So to guard against this, people went to this parliamentary system during the transition period and gave the sovereign council very few powers, you know. But whether the country, you know, uh, fits the parliamentary system or the presidential system is debatable. And surprisingly, our Prime Minister, Hamdouk, uh, and this uh, reminds me of Gunnar's question, yes, I, we believe we have, uh, we, have, we have the good man, you know. He's, he's very capable. The Prime Minister, actually, he said in his first televised interview that he prefers the presidential system. But this has to be decided after the end of the transitional period. Uh, the issues that... <laughs> Uh, Wait. Why there is the, uh, with uh, Salah Gush? Salah Gush, uh, I don't. Uh, this is the, by the way, Salah Gush is a security person who was in charge of the regime, the the final stages of the regime, uh, and uh, he is now. Well, he is he is free somehow, but uh, he is trying to find his way out uh, back. Uh, to government, and uh, when uh, I see in the, in the social media that he has been really trying to uh, link himself with the, uh, the UNP, the, the Democratic Unionist Party, but uh, that is still something which is uh, we don't know. We, we, we can't really judge how the situation is. But um, going back to the issue that uh, was talked about uh, by Manzul. Now, who is going to rule the country? How, how is the country to be ruled, but not 
who is going to rule it. And I think that is really uh, looking at the kind of the situation as it is, the kind of rule you have in the country as such. Whether it is going to be a federal state, whether the regions will be really given an opportunity to rule themselves, or whether they, you will have the wallies, uh, the, the, the governors for each region, uh, and how much is it going to, de to be divided. The kind of issue which really raises itself is a recognition of the fact that this is a country where there are different people, they have to be differently ruled, and they have to be a certain kind of governance which really have to respond to the needs of the, each region. The, 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 the situation in the Sudan is a country where you have uh, a variety of, 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 uh, of uh, situations uh, in terms of the people, in terms of uh, production in these areas and so on and so forth. It, it is really the kind of governance that you really need to implement in the country. And we have experienced uh, certain ways of rules, whether this is a central government or whether it is federal, the way the, the Bashir group has practiced. And now we have to really look into the situation, evaluate it, and really come with another type of, perhaps a, a different type of, uh, of governance system. Okay. Uh, I think I will start from the point that uh, Andri and Prof. Abdullah raised regarding how the country can be ruled. I think before answering this question, we need to identify ourselves. So the identity of Sudan come first. Are we African? Are we Arab? Are we Islamic country? So this is a problem that now the, the you know the, the the agendas of all parties revolve. On. For example, we have Basi Party. Can you believe that? The Saddam Party we, are, we have in Sudan. Yeah, and it opened in the Jomhuriya Street. They have huge, yes, it is freedom of, you know, to organization. Yeah, you are free to be belong to Arab or something like this. But the identity of Sudan uh, should be uh, defined. As I, I, I was in the city, and I have heard that the people want to be themselves on the Nubian civilization. So before we go and deliver in the presidential system or parliamentary system, we need to identify themselves. So if you go to Kandaka and the, 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 the icons that we have seen near the military headquarters, people want the, 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 to go back to ancient century and bring their own uh, culture in order to rule the country. So if we go back, I think we will, we will not see, for example, rebels in the Blue Nile area in South Darfur, because most of these people are African. Yes, they are purely African. They speak Arabic. We share the language. Like, for example, Brazil, we speak Portuguese. It doesn't matter to speak the language, whatever you speak, but the, 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 the identity itself needs to, need to be decided so we can go forward. Okay, regarding the question by Hueda for, for, for the view of bread and, yeah, I think according, uh, for me, I am economist, and I'm very proud to be one of the supporters of the capitalistic system, because uh, I think the market is very intelligent in order to organize the people. Yeah, even the book that, all book written about inequality that caused by capitalists, I think they are fake, because they just look to to, 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 to that people are not equal. Yes, they are not equal, but they are lifted from poverty. So when we judge the capitalist system, we, look to the, we should look to, the, to who is lifted from poverty. So now the, the world is better, not because of the communist system, not because of the socialist system, because of the capitalist system. Uh, regarding the question of... Uh, Foreign investor. Yes, we need foreigners to come to invest because it is not just that we are undercapitalized. Also, we need to copy the experience of the rest of the world. You, you talk about agriculture. 
we need biotechnology to, to apply it to our agricultural sector in order to increase the product and productivity so we can um, realize self-satisfaction and then export to the rest of the world. So the, the FDI or foreign direct investment is not a matter of just we have land, we have resources. No, just we need to, 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 to take a part in the world economy and to integrate in it. Okay. Hey, thank you so much. Um, we are way over time, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm very um, uh, pleased to complete this uh, conversation. So thank you for the panelists and also to the audience for our excellent questions. So.